A man in a turban with his hands clasped and murmuring prayers pursued the monsters. He had indeed a strange countenance totally unlike ordinary men. His face was the color of gold, his mustache and beard were cut, short and even. He had the eyebrows of a phoenix with a high nose and black eyes. His clothes were white, and a jewel girdle of jade encircled his lower torso. On his head was a cloth turban set like a coiled dragon. His presence was awe-inspiring. He knelt toward the west, reading a book he held in his hand. When the monsters saw him, they took proper corporeal forms and pleaded for forgiveness in distress, yet the turban man continued to read, until the monsters turned to blood, and at last to dust, and the sound of the turban man's voice dissipated. <laughs> Within the span of less than a century, Islam's impact was felt all over the known world. By 715 AD, the Umayyad Caliphate controlled lands from Transoxania and Sindh in the east to Iberia in the west, and its influence was felt far past its frontier. That of course includes Tang China. Indeed, the beginning of Islam's long relationship with China may have begun as early as the 650s AD, during the Caliphate of Uthman, when according to Huay tradition, the companion of the Prophet wasallam, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, visited Guangzhou as a missionary, spreading the faith. In fact, it is there in Guangzhou on the southeastern coast of China that its oldest mosque can be found, the Great Canton Mosque. It was built over 1300 years ago and the simple fact of its construction suggests that there was a significant Muslim population there at the time. Whether Sa'ad really visited Guangzhou and had a hand in the construction of this mosque is debatable. He has a tomb there but is believed to have been actually buried in Jannatul Baqia in Medina. Regardless, Islam's presence in the region during this time is not debatable. Muslim merchants seem to have been responsible for their religion's establishment in the east, whereas in the west the frontier between the Caliphate and Tang China was being pushed ever farther. Following Muawiyah's victory in the first fitna, the newly established Umayyad Caliphate did not take long to settle before its first incursions into Chinese-influenced Central Asia. These were, however, limited to small raids, and the real conquest of the lands past the Oxus would not begin until 705 under Qutaybah bin Muslim, who was governor of Khorasan at the time. Qutaybah had overseen the expansion of the caliphate to as far north as the Fergana Valley, and had puppet rulers installed in the region. By this point, the western Gokturk Khaganate and its surrounding polities were only nominally under the sovereignty of Tang China. However, the emperor in the east still took this as an overstep by the Arabs. Continued Arab aggression in the region would culminate in the Battle of Aqsu in 717 AD, the first clash between these two nations, where the Tang were successful in expelling the Umayyads from Transoxania almost completely. The next major clash would not occur until after the Third Fitna and the replacement of the Umayyad Caliphate with the Abbasids. In 751, only a year after as safah had seized the caliphate from the Umayyads, he was leading an army alongside Abu Muslim to meet the Chinese in a decisive battle at Tolas in modern-day Kyrgyzstan. Chinese and Arab sources contradict each other concerning the troop numbers, however modern estimates suggest that both armies were of a comparable size. This changed during the battle, however, when a large contingent of Karlik Turkic mercenaries defected to the Abbasids, tipping the scales and causing a near rout of the Tang Chinese forces. From this day, Muslims would maintain a firm grasp on the region for the next five centuries, enjoying the riches of the Silk Road which flowed through the trading hubs of Central Asia, such as Samarkand, Bukhara, and Merv. This was, of course, significant as China was a massive part of the Silk Road, and for this region to change hands in such a manner marked a huge shift and the beginning of a long-lasting economic hegemony. I would also like to mention that Central Asia would quickly become a very important center of learning under Islamic rule, specifically under the Samanids, who were generous patrons of the sciences. The likes of Imam al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam al-Matridi, al-Khwarizmi, and later Ibn Sina and al-Bayruni all hailed from the region. At the time of its conquest, the region was probably one of the most religiously diverse in the world, with Manichaeism, Zoroastrianism, and Buddhism all being prominent. 
Following the Battle of Toulouse, the Chinese were forced to completely withdraw from the region, allowing the Abbasids and their Tibetan allies to claim the now ungoverned lands. The An Lushan Rebellion in 755 only hastened this collapse, as the attention of the Tang Emperor was drawn elsewhere. Unfortunately, it was during this rebellion that the Yangzhou Massacre occurred, where many thousands of merchant class Arabs and Persians were killed by Tian Shengong as he looted the city to help fund the emperor's fight against the rebellious Yan dynasty. Because of the resounding victory of the Muslims at Talas, many prisoners of war were taken from among the Tang regulars. Some were brought back to Kufa, whilst some were jailed in Samarkand. Arab sources often credit some of these prisoners of war with the introduction of paper making to the Islamic world. One of these prisoners of war, taken from the Battle of Tolas, was Du Huan, who was allowed to travel freely and recorded some of his journey before returning to China 11 years after his capture. He relayed much of his travels to a relative of his known as Du Yo. Du Yo was a Chinese general and historian, and in his encyclopedia consisting of 200 volumes, the Tong Dian, for which he is known, he writes on what Du Huan and others observed of contemporary Arabs and Islamic society as a whole. Here is some of what he said. Regarding the Arabian Peninsula and its inhabitants, he wrote, The men of the land have large noses. They are dark-skinned and heavily bearded. Their women are dignified and beautiful. Their writing system differs from that of the Persians. The soil has much sand and is not suitable for cultivation. It was only when they defeated Persia and Byzantium that they obtained rice and baked goods. They worship the god of heaven. Despite being slightly exaggerated, this passage illustrates Duyo's understanding of the region and of the Arabs as a separate people from the Persians, with whom they would have had very little contact up to this point. It is very fascinating to view this perspective on the contemporary Muslim world from someone who lived most of his life within Tang, China. Elsewhere, he writes of Du Huan's time spent in Kufa, the Abbasid capital at the time. The king of the Arabs is called Mu Men which I believe is a corruption of Amir al-Mu'minin, and he has made this place, Kufa, his capital. The men and women of this place are tall and well-built. They wear fine and clean garments, and their manners are gentle and elegant. When women go outdoors, they must cover up their faces with veils. Five times a day, all of the people, whether humble or noble, pray to heaven. They eat meat as a religious observance, and they consider killing animals merit-worthy, uh, which would be strange, as a lot of China would have been Buddhist at this time. They wear silver belts decorated with silver knives. They prohibit wine and avoid music. When they quarrel, they do not come to blows. There is also a prayer hall which holds tens of thousands. Every seven days, the king attends the prayers, mounts a high seat, and expounds the religious law to the people, saying, Men's life is hard. This is the immutable will of heaven. If you commit one of the following crimes, lewdness, kidnapping, robbery, mean actions, slander, self-gratification at the expense of others, cheating the poor and oppressing the humble, your sins are among the most heinous. Those who are killed by the enemy will be reborn in heaven. Those who kill the enemy will enjoy unlimited good fortune. It is clear that Du Huan recognized and respected the Muslims, and the way that the population and the state were exceedingly observant to religious principle, at least during the time of his visit. Again, a truly fascinating window into a rather obscure and lesser known perspective, ignoring some minor inaccuracies. He continues, Within the city walls and the villages, all of the earth's products are here. Nothing is lacking. Varieties of merchandise have been brought here in immense quantities and are sold at very low prices. Silk and embroideries, pearls and shells are piled up in the markets. Camels and horses, donkeys and mules jam the streets and alleys. This is not the only account of the prosperity of the Islamic world at the time. In fact, this was very well documented. Still though, China would have also been very prosperous at this time, at least before the Anlushan Rebellion, so to see such a reverent description is meaningful. The addition of Transoxania and the dominance over the Silk Road that it brought would only cause this economic prosperity to grow even further. All of this indicates much of what we already know from other accounts during the time, however, it is the perspective here that matters. By this point in history, relations were firmly established between the Chinese and the Islamic worlds, even if those relations were sometimes of a belligerent nature. There was an evident mutual respect held by these two nations, which I will cover more in depth in future parts to this series. 
Unfortunately, near the end of Tang rule in China in 878 AD, the rebel leader Huang Chao would seize Guangzhou and massacre the foreign population of the city, killing what modern historians estimate to be tens of thousands of people. This was not limited to only Muslims but all foreigners. Although the Tang Empire were able to recover somewhat from the Anlushan Rebellion, they could not recover from this. They were thrust into a swift and unstoppable decline that would culminate in a complete governmental collapse in 907 AD. Guangzhou would remain a crucial trading post even through the Ten Kingdoms period, with its management often in the hands of Muslims. In fact, a sizable foreign quarter was established, which would only continue to grow under the rule of the Song Dynasty. The foreign populations, especially within this region, had changed into naturalized settlers, a crucial piece to a complicated economic and social puzzle. In fact, it was during this period that Muslims came to hold a particularly strong sway over Chinese foreign trade. Almost every large city by this point would have housed a mosque, and many housed Arab Muslim embassies. Indeed, during the reign of the Song Dynasty we see many facets of Islamic culture and even science begin to seep into the fabric of Chinese society. For instance, according to D.D. Leslie in his paper, The Old Testament and Biblical Figures in Chinese Sources, the stories of the prophets such as Joseph, Abraham, and Ishmael, when given mention in Chinese literature, were all based on Islamic sources, not Jewish sources. This, however, was not a one-way exchange, as it was around this time when stories of China began appearing in Arabic literature, namely in A Thousand One Nights. When it comes to science, many medicines incorporated into the Chinese medical corpus can be linked back directly to Ibn Sina's famous work The Canon of Medicine, or Al-Qanun Fit-Tib in Arabic. One account of Muslims in China from the Song era goes as follows. The Sea People in reference to Persians and Arabs, are by nature superstitious and love cleanliness. Every day they prostrate themselves and pray for blessing. They have halls where they worship, just like the Buddhists, except they do not set up images. When they meet, in the morning they eat, they do not use chopsticks, rather they eat only with their right hands, and when the meal is over they wash with water. A more comical one here, in reference to the Great Mosque of Canton I mentioned earlier, in the foreign pagoda, i.e. the mosque, every year during the fifth or sixth month the barbarians, Muslims, climb at daybreak to its peak and call the Buddha's name, Allah's name, praying for a response. This is clearly in reference to the Adhan, and although uninformed, I thought I would include this quote for fun. During Song Emperor Shenzong's campaign against the Great Liao in 1070, he recruited 5,300 predominantly Muslim men from Bukhara into his army, who were later settled near Beijing and Kaifeng. Ten years later, in an attempt to repopulate the area, the emperor had 10,000 more Muslims, both men and women, settle in and around this area, establishing a community under the leadership of the Bukharan emir Sufair, most likely uh, Zubair. It was Sufer who called Islam Huey Huey, which is of course where the term Huey is derived from. That is where I will leave off for today, as I don't want the video to drag on. This will be a multi-part series, so I will continue chronologically and talk about the Mongols and the Yuan Dynasty in the next part. Liking and subscribing always helps, of course. Until next time. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. السلام عليكم